Welcome back to the Jake Sink with Jacob L.A. Share podcast. I'm your host, Jacob L.A. Share, the chief content producer and writer of jakesink.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. If you are new to this channel and if you're watching this video, please like and subscribe to this video. Or if you're listening, please give us a five star rating and also please subscribe if you're listening on audio. It, I am thrilled to welcome our next guest today. Today's guest is a Spotify verified artist. And as of this recording, he has over 10,200 Instagram followers, and he also has 51,700 Facebook fans. He's also the director of the upcoming science fiction and horror film, Lumina. Please help me welcome Gino McCoy. Thank you, Jake, for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your show. What a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. You. I always give my guests the best welcome yet. I know, it, it, like I was saying, it reminded me of um, that, you know, opening of like uh, the announcements when they do it for like New York Knicks, <laughs> the starting lineups in Madison Square Gardens. <laughs> Maybe I should try, to go, try out Madison Square Garden. Yeah, Madison Square Gardens is really good, man. It's like I, I grew up a big New York Knicks fan, so I, I always used to, I always would listen to like how they would make the introductions for the players. <laughs> it sounded like that. So nice to be on your show, Jake. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's get started. So when did you get interested in, in, in the entertainment industry and how did that passion evolve into desire to pursue a career in it? Um, it's interesting because I, I grew up around like both my mom and my dad being heavy into music. And my father had his own band, basically, and stuff like that. And I grew up around music my entire life, basically, for both sides of my family. So um, when I graduated from University of Toronto and stuff like that, um, I decided to, you know, work in, like, the bank and work in the financial sector. And then I said, well, this is not for me. And so I went back into my passion, which was music. And it took me out to L.A. You know, I did my first first album in Los Angeles um, at Ocean Studios in Burbank. And then after that, you know, my, my producer's like, you know, you need to go to LA because that's where you know, all, all the talent's going to be exposed there and that's where you're going to get your break. And I moved out to LA and started in the music industry. And at first, you know, I met with a lot of labels and they're interested in signing me, but they wanted me to do something different in terms of the music I wanted to do. And I didn't want to do that. So I never signed and I stayed independent. And I came up with an idea where I'm going to put my music in a movie. So I started writing scripts. And my first script I wrote, um, I wrote it in about two weeks. It's Little Miss Innocent. It's um, about female action, female born. You know, I, I was one of the first, I was actually the first in Hollywood to speak about the deep web and the Bitcoin. And, you know, it was quite a while ago, I think about close to like eight years ago, six, seven, eight years ago. And basically from there, I was like, okay, well, I want to get someone to direct it and everything else and put my music in my movie. And, you know, I went through a lot in terms of like obstacles and a lot of, you know, heartache in terms of the film industry and also the music industry. And I decided, well, look, I'm going to direct this thing myself. And, you know, we, we got the financing. My mom was a former director of RBC, so she had a lot of finance connections and we finally got this movie off and, LMI got postponed because my lead um, got pregnant and it went into development hell, but I had a lot of A-list actors attached to that movie. And then I wrote Lumina and I wrote Lumina about seven days in Florida, by my uncle's house in Florida. And we decided to get all the finance and everything else. And we finally got the movie off and, you know, we decided to do it. And, and that took me here. You know what I mean? I decided to shoot in Morocco and, you know, basically putting my music in the movie was a big thing because I'm like, you know, that's that's one way I could control my my creativity. You know, someone else instead of the label telling me exactly what to do and you know what what creative direction to take my music, I have my own autonomy. You know, I was autonomous in terms of making my own decisions in terms of the music, and you know, coming out with my own feature film allowed me to put my music the way how I wanted to do it in my movie. And that was basically like I guess a brief summary in terms of how I got into Hollywood. You know, how I got into you know film. Because at first I just became a writer because I wrote, I, growing up, I wrote, I wrote a lot of um, short stories and poetry growing up as a kid. And, you know, I guess it turned into like, you know, writing scripts. <laughs> and the first script I read was Michael Mann's Heat. 
you know. So Heat was one of my favorite movies growing up as a kid, and I read his script for it, and then I learned how to write, learn how to write scripts reading Michael Mann stuff. So, and that was it. I got into it, wrote my first script, and I guess the rest is history. Awesome. That now that's incredible. That's an incredible story. I know that you went to. I want to speak on Luna because the thing is, you filmed. It's the first science fiction and horror film to be shot in Morocco. And the film, guys, is coming out in September. So why do you decide that Morocco is a perfect venue for this new for this film? Yeah, good question. I think um, you know, we first had Tunisia and we had Malta for uh, were were our first choices. Malta, of course, doesn't have deserts, and I have to do underground military bases, and I needed a desert location because that's how I wrote the script. And Malta did, doesn't have deserts. So um, that wasn't the location I thought I could do. And then we thought about Tunisia because, you know, I'm a big George Lucas fan. I'm a big Star Wars fan. So, you know, George shot in Tunisia and Tatooine <laughs> is an actual oh, town yeah. in Tunisia. You know, so um, they didn't have the stages to accommodate my, my set bills, you know, with my production designers. So... I chose Morocco because I scouted Morocco and I researched it. It had a really rich film history, you know, Ridley Scott and a lot of very big filmmakers, Scorsese, a lot of big filmmakers that shot in Morocco. Um, the crews were on par with Los Angeles and they had stages to accommodate the bills I needed to do. Because I have stage bills, I have locations. It's, 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 a, multi, it's a, a, lot, a multitude of things in the movie itself that I needed. And... Morocco just became the destination and I went there and it was, you know, at first it was tough. You know, we went to a really bad production company at first, you know, almost, you know, delayed our project. And then we had to switch our production company to another one. And we went to Dune Films and Dune did like, you know, Kingdom of Heaven, a lot of other big movies. And, you know, we went through real baptism of fire there, a real learning curve that we had to go through shooting overseas because you know what I've, I've done music videos I've done short films and stuff like that in Canada and the US but I've never shot overseas especially in Africa in Morocco and it was like you know I grew up learning and speaking French but you know my French is very rusty I haven't spoke French for 25 years so conversational has been terrible and they speak French as their second language and their first language is Arabic so it's like you know a lot of people spoke English and everything else and you know it, it was a big adjustment and, you know, we, we got through it and we shot it during COVID. And, you know, we had a lot of difficulty with that, but at the same time we fought through it and, you know, we completed the film and we were, we were one of the only Hollywood features, international features from Hollywood to shoot and complete during COVID, you know, during that, that time in 2020. an incredible accomplishment in that itself. It is an incredible accomplishment, accomplishment you know. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was it was tough, Jake. It was like, you know, testing every week. You know, we had two people come down with, with COVID. We isolated them. You know, I got food poisoning for 12 days. Oh, I'm so you know, sorry. We had, we, had, we, had, we had, you know, some really, really unscrupulous cast walk off. I had to recast the entire feature over a week and a half. It was like a lot, a lot of um, complications, but we got through it. And it was almost like doing 10 films in one. And, you know, we fought through all that adversity. We went, we, we, overcame, we overcame all those obstacles. And we got the film done. And a lot of people are, like, really surprised. Me because it's, it's my first film. It's my debut feature. You know, I haven't shot other films before. And it's so funny because my editor did an interview. Um, Tom Noble, he won the Oscar from Witness. Very, 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 very top editor. Um, from Hollywood, a very good friend of mine. He was the editor on Lumina. And he's like, he's like, it's amazing what we accomplished doing that through COVID. And he was like, Gino, for a first time director, he's like, you know, I, and, and writing for the first time, he's like, yeah, I'm ready for a big film after this because, you know, I did something that a lot of people thought was impossible to shoot during that time. Especially in a foreign country. And my first film. It's, it's not, you know, it would have been different if I shot in Los Angeles because I lived in L.A. for close to a decade or Toronto or London, where I grew up going to and other places. But no, we shot in Morocco. It was beautiful, great landscapes, everything else. But it was really complicated, too. You know, if dealing I with remember, new laws and regulations. And if I remember correctly, I'm sorry to interrupt. If I remember correctly, 
Los Angeles, London, and uh, all had to shut down their production because of COVID. Yes. I had friends on a Will Smith production got shut down in Los Angeles. I had friends in Toronto that was working on a Guillermo del Toro project. Um, he was the first AD. They got shut down. Um, there was a lot of projects getting shut down. Ours didn't. <laughs> yeah. My friend, my, my friend who's a DP who was shooting on that Will Smith project in Los Angeles was like, he's like, you're lucky, G. You know, you guys, you guys fought through it. You guys completed it. We got shut down so many times. You know, and projects had to be postponed till this year and finishing like in 2021. And, you know, with the new COVID protocol and like, you know, different zones and different, like, you know, opening up and everything else that was happening in North America, it was like, it was different, but you know, it was safe in Morocco. They really, really have, have it under control there. Um, we, we took extra precautions and we also were very organized and a lot of people were surprised. Yeah, this is our first film, but we, we handled it like, you know, a bigger, a bigger independent production company or like a, or like a studio because it really, it really, it was almost like a studio film over there. And, you know, we're the first film that shot out of the lockdown of COVID in Morocco. And the first sci-fi film, which I didn't even know about till, you know, everyone told me, they're like, yeah, you're creating history, Moroccan cinema history here. So I think like, you know, all in all, it was like a really good experience. We experience. We're blessed, I thank God for it. And, you know, it was really, it was really an experience that I'll always remember. And something I'll take forward with me in the future in terms of, you know, working and, and doing films and everything else. And I think it's, it's given me that type of experience to, you know, do other films, bigger films, and and to deal with stuff that you would never deal with. Like, you know, it was the first time in history that we had cast walk off of our film, and it wasn't to do with us. You know, my casting hey. director, Valerie McCaffrey, you know, she used to be the head of casting of Warner Brothers and, and Universal, and first time she's ever seen that. My attorney also used to be a new line. So, you know, I have a lot of experienced people behind me. And this is the first time they ever see something like that happen. And like, you know, it was, it was during a really turbulent time, which is COVID. And, you know, the cast was very unscrupulous to do that and underhanded when they did it. And especially because a lot of actors were out of work. You know, 90% or more actors were out of work during that time. And they had an opportunity to perform and then stuff happened. And then, you know, we had to recast the entire thing. I, I had a week, Jake, to recast, a week and a half to recast my entire movie. And shoot. I can't believe and I you shot pulled that off. Well, Valerie and I were working like at least 16 hour days for like a week and a half. That's just amazing. It was, that is just it amazing. Was, yeah, and Cass, put it this way Cass read it, they loved it, and I, I basically chose them based on the reels, everything else, and different takes that they have done something like one of them actually did like a self tape before and I chose them. And as soon as I chose them, they flew out the next day to Morocco. And here's, the, and here's the thing. Uh, yeah. Which is incredible, which is incredible by and incredible for their takes because there's a lot, I spoke with a lot of actors and I have friend call, and I have colleagues that are actors as well. And it's so weird here that they would walk off a project like that. Because every because well, they're act like you're right because they're actors who would have died for a job. Yeah, ninety percent of the actors in SAG were dying for a job, and like even British actors and in, in, um, in British Equity and everything else. And you know we we felt like you know we had one of them that's just basically lie on us about like our COVID protocols, and we proved SAG we proved to SAG the Screen Actors Guild that. You know, we were telling the truth and they still sided with the actor because it's an actor. And, you know, our attorneys got involved and everything else and, and they backed us up because, you know, we were good people. We were a good, we were a good production company and we, we lost our money on them. And, you know, they wanted to take money and walk off and outperforming. And, you know, afterwards we found out there was a bit of jealousy going on there in terms of me being a young director coming out with such a big movie at this time. And some jealousy happened and they walked off and, you know, we had to recast the entire film. And, you know, I was placed on the pressure that you would never see a first-time director have to face that type of pressure, Jay. It was like pressure that first-time directors never have to cope with. They, they don't deal with those type of situations on their first feature film. 
And, you know, I had to deal with that. I had to deal with coming off of food poisoning after 12 days and, you know, telling my actors, I'm going to start, I'm going to, you know, we're ready to get back going and stuff like that. And then they walked off two days afterwards, you know, and then basically, you know, my, my attorneys were shocked. My casting director, everyone is well known in the industry that I'm with, you know, my editor, my DP at the time, Larry Smith, you know, Larry worked with like Stanley Kubrick, you know, he's famous for his collaborations with Stanley Kubrick and Larry flew from UK with my entire camera team camera team from the UK and he he was shocked he was appalled at their behavior you know and it was like okay so we moved on and then you know we started shooting we had to shoot we basically shot through Christmas tree in Morocco so what happened was we got the new cast in I had a day and a half to prep these actors to really rehearse and prep these actors I was doing block and rehearsals on set day of when we're shooting. And I shot this film in like 28 or 29 days, which is impossible for this type of film to be shot in 28 or 29 days. It was originally set for about 25. Yeah, and it's certainly you know, and, and COVID and testing and a new country and this and actors come and, you know, we're building sets and we're doing special effects and we're blowing up stuff. We're, we're we're building sets, we're doing visual effects, we're doing everything in this movie. There's so many different effects. Creature effects. You know, I had a creature, we had a creature build because um, Todd Masters, uh, who built um, Predator, you know, and worked on a lot of the stuff, the Predator suit and everything else, he flew in the alien that I helped design from Vancouver, you know, and that was sent on like, you know, special cargo and stuff like that over to Morocco to get, you know, our stunt actors in these creature suits you know, because it's an alien movie, right? And stuff like that. And we had creature effects, special effects, visual effects, all of that intertwined, multiple locations. You know, we were shooting, we were shooting in the Western Sahara, like in, in Wazazat and the road to Agdez, when it was like zero to minus two degrees, you know, in the, at nighttime, in rocky landscapes, 70 degree inclines on mountainsides, you know, blowing stuff up and everything else. It was a very, very difficult film in terms of the weather and everything else in it. And and the locations, because we had so many different locations. And I had I had like basically twenty-five to twenty-eight days to shoot this film in. And you know, if you showed that to a lot of other my directors, our friends in Hollywood, they'd be like, Hey, you're crazy. <laughs> they'll say you're crazy to shoot it in that time. Like, you know, they they weren't expecting it. They would never sign on for something in such a little bit of time. But I did it and I was a first time director. So, you know, when Tom said that, like, you know, I did an amazing job, I'm ready for a big film, he really means that because, you know. He worked with Ridley Scott. He worked with the Coen Brothers. He worked with a lot of big directors. And, you know, being with me as a first time director and seeing what I executed in that short period of time, given the type of obstacle and circumstances that we faced on this film, it was incredible. All I have to do is thank God for it. Like, you know, the team and, and the actors coming out and acting and really, you know, supporting the film, the ones I, I recasted because they came out and they gave 100%. You know, I thank them and I thank, you know, my mom and my dad who are producers on the film, Linda and Hudson, and also our very good friend, David Seychelle, who, you know, was also producer on the film as well. And who's my mom's very good friend going back in Canada. And that was part of it. He actually couldn't attend this, the, the movie. He couldn't come on um, to help in, producing, in a producing capacity because when he was flying out to LA three weeks before he was supposed to go to Morocco, he got in a plane crash and a third of his body was burnt. And he was in the University of Colorado Hospital and we flew out there and we spent two weeks with him, basically, you know, and, and God saved his life, you know what I mean? So it was like, all that happened before we went to shoot in Morocco, you know? So it was like Whoa. a lot of stuff. My DP, my DP at the time, I had another DP before Larry came on board. He dropped off the day before we were supposed to fly out to Morocco. So I went to Morocco without a DP. And I had to look for a DP. This is all during COVID in 2020. And essentially, when I got Larry on board, Larry shot the first two days. And then, as I told you, we shot through Christmas. So he went back to the UK with my camera team for the Christmas break. And then the second strain hit in the UK and they weren't allowed back in Morocco. So I lost my DP and my entire camera team. And then I, I called my friend, Gabrielle Berestein, 
And actually, he was just at the premiere of Black Widow yesterday because he's the DP on Black Widow with Scarlett Johansson from Marvel. And I called Gabby, and I'm like, Gabby, like, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a bind here, bro. <laughs> and he was like, he's like, he's he's working on uh, on a Ron Perlman film right now, but he would have loved to come to Morocco and shoot the movie with me because he's a good friend. He's like, however, I have a friend who's a DP who was kind of like my understudy who I brought up through the ranks, and she's a female DP and she's really good. And, you know, Raquel was a DP at that time. And he sent Raquel. And Raquel was supposed to come on and drop back to um, the main ca A camera operator under Larry. But Larry couldn't come back because, you know, the second strain hit the UK and he couldn't leave the UK, you know, at that time. So she ended up shooting the rest of the movie with me. Wow. Yeah. She ended up shooting the rest of the movie with me. This is just insane. Like you had a, a literally a story, a comedy of errors movie that you are going to release it in September. And that's an incredible accomplishment, you know. Say again. You're, you have to deal with the comedy of errors and then all of a sudden you've actually conquered the film. You're going to release this film. Yeah, it's it, it was it was something that I wasn't expecting, and but it 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 really put me through a real baptism of fire into like filmmaking, and you know I was able to to conquer it, you know, with our team and everyone else, who, who, you know, with a lot of faith in God and, and be like just getting it through and like you know a really great team and you know I have to thank like doing films in Morocco for helping us too and. You know, everyone who supported us during that time and the actors and my casting director and my attorneys and everyone else, because, you know, it, it was the most difficult time to shoot a film in film history during this COVID. And I, really I did it. And you did it. And congratulations. I really hope people do attempt to go to Lumina. But however, maybe there's some songs in Lumina that might be familiar to my listeners. I was like, look, I was listening to some of your songs. I was like, I want to start a sentence seat girl. Can you please tell me the story behind that song? <laughs> well, Sensi girl was a song that I wrote because Sensi in the Caribbean is short for Sense Emilia. So it's short for weed. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah, Sensi is a is a is a slang term in Trinidad and Tobago because I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago, and um, we use it's, sent, it's short for Sense Emilia, which is a female strain of the weed plant that has no seeds. So I was like, yeah, I wanted to sing about a girl who smokes weed, so it was like Sense Emilia, so Sensi girl. Awesome, and I was jamming out to Runaway. It's your rock track. Oh, Runaway, yeah, Runaway. When it was an interesting song because it, it it started off with my uncle basically bringing like a, a song to me and I started working on it with me and my dad as a collaboration of three of us. And I wrote the lyrics and the lyrics really tell of a bad relationship with a girl <laughs> and getting away from that bad relationship. And that's how I, I, I wrote Runaway. <laughs> so that was like the basis of like the lyrics on that one. Awesome. I also, Everything to Me. Ah, Everything to Me is a straight up love song. It's a love ballad. It, it, really, it really tells of anybody, anyone that you're in love with, you know, like your spouse, your partner, your, your significant other, your, your mom, your dad, your cousin, your brother, you know, your sister, someone, no, someone special in your life, you know, a dog. <laughs> An animal that's special in your life. It, I mean, it could it could apply to everything. So it was like a love song inside, and you know, it's interesting because you know, Lumina is the underlying love story. The lead goes after his girl, you know, to save his girlfriend that has been abducted, and you know, everything to me is a song, and that's why I put it in there because it, it relates to well, that girl is everything to him, so he's willing to risk everything. So. I guess that's the online theme of it right there. Sensi Girl is like, you know, relates to one of the other characters in the movie, Patricia. And Runaway is basically like a nice song. It's like really airy and like involves in like really action sequence that people are going to see. So I think all the songs I put into the movie basically have, um, they're, they're, 
uniquely match with the scene that the song is playing in, that relates to that scene, that particular scene. Wonderful, wonderful. We got to start winding down our conversation. So let's talk social media. What are your favorite apps? Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, and why do they stand out? Um, IG, definitely. Instagram. I was one I was one of the first Instagram users to go on there and use it. Um, Facebook, of course, you know, at Gino McCoy, you know, G-I-N-O-M-C-K-O-Y, both on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I haven't used Twitter a lot, even though I'm very political. I'm very politically outspoken. You know, political science was my major in University of Toronto because I graduated from University of Toronto. Um, it's interesting I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> I am on Twitter, but I don't use it. I, I'd rather use like Instagram and like Facebook and stuff like that. Um, YouTube, yes, because of my music videos and everything else. So I am on YouTube. I have my YouTube channel. I have a verified channel on YouTube, a Vivo channel on YouTube. I'm Gina McCoy, of course. So um, yeah, those are my three favorites, I think. TikTok, I got into TikTok, but you know, I, I dance well, but I don't do a lot of the dances and stuff like that. I just like watching it sometimes, you know. But I mean, I think I think there's more substance on Facebook and, and Instagram, in my opinion, and YouTube. I agree completely. I'm more of a face I'm more of a YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter guy. I do not know how to do TikTok for the life of me. <laughs> TikTok is not my thing, brother. <laughs> not me TikTok too. is like, you know what it is? It's almost like Okay, you do a great dance. You're gonna get you're gonna get discovered. Okay, fine, that's cool. It's just like okay. it's, it's just for like it's just for like putting music in a song so you can get your music exposed, and then it it goes viral, you know, and stuff like that. TikTok is good for that in terms of a marketing platform. But I mean, me personally, I don't know. I'm not gonna be doing any dances on videos and stuff like that because, you know, I think I'm too mature for that. <laughs> it's a younger format. I totally agree. So. Why should my audience check out Lumina? Um, repeat that. Why should my audience check out Lumina? Why should they check out Lumina? Yeah. I think they should check out Lumina because it's a unique film. It's it's not just standard science fiction film. There's comedy in it. There's horror. There's action. There's an underlying love story. Um, it, it deals with a theme that hasn't been done much in science fiction. Only X Files covered it once, um, but this one goes more deeper into it because you actually see how people are psychologically affected by someone being taken, and I think you know that's something that you see with our characters because you get to know each one of them intimately during the movie itself, and that sets it aside from a lot of other films because you know you get to see how it affects them psychologically on this person disappearing, and you know it's a theme that a lot of people don't really get tap into. And I think, you know, with the underlying love story, with the action, with the comedy, I think there's a lot of stuff that, you know, inter, uh, that's intertwined into Lumina that, you know, a lot of different people, a lot of different demographics and genres and everything else and people in different lifestyles would appreciate because each character speaks to someone. It's very unique. Each of my characters in Lumina speaks to someone individually. And I think that, almost everyone will be able to identify one of the characters. I think it's one of those type of movies. And I think that's why people will appreciate it. Awesome. Now, where can I, uh, I know you spoke briefly about it on social media, but where can they find your music and where can, and also where they can find more information about Lumina? Okay, well, you can find my music and, and Lumina on my, my IG, which is at Gino McCoy, G-I-N-O-M-C-K-O-Y. Also on my Facebook. Gina McCoy, my verified page. And they could also find it at luminamovie.com. So luminamovie.com. And they could also find me on Spotify and all the streaming platforms for my music, definitely. Awesome, guys. If you missed an and episode YouTube. of YouTube. Oh, and my, my Vivo channel on YouTube. Yes, Gina McCoy. Awesome. Now, guys, if you missed an episode of the Jake's Take with Jacob LHR podcast, head to our channels on Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Spreaker. Just type in Jake's Take with Jacob Elyashar, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Once again, Jacob Elyashar, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Now, are you on social media? Because I'm on social media too. 
Head to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Same spelling, Jacob L. Ashart, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Now, guys, jakestake.com, the blog that started everything, is turning 10 this year. So if you want to find out more articles, interviews, and reviews on music, head to jakes.shake.com. Once again, jakes.shake.com. And guys, if you're financially able to, please consider heading to PayPal to help keep the Jake's Take com and my platform up and running i'm the only one that does this if you can do that that's fine if not please subscribe please share it with everyone and i appreciate it gino thank you so much for talking to me today you have an incredible story jacob thank you so much and i wish you the best on the podcast i would love to be back on it's a pleasure to speak to you and all the best to you brother and thank you so much and check out jake's show man it's great he's a great guy take care thanks gene Thank you, Gina. Have a great day, everybody. Until next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye, Jake. Bye.